There's a lot of debate and controversy in the Bigfoot community, or competition as it should possibly be called, around whether Bigfoot can produce infrasound, and if that's responsible for some of the bizarre effects people experience during and after their encounters. I have a feeling that the reluctance for many Bigfoot researchers to adopt and run with this theory other than just um, bitchiness within the community, comes down to an improper understanding of how infrasound works and how sound works in general. So here's a crash course on the physics of sound. Sound is simply compression waves emanating through air in all directions from its source. And the source can be something being hit or plucked, basic movement. So to visualise this, think of waves caused by a pebble thrown into a still pond, but in three dimensions instead of just the surface. An easy way to understand sound is to study how a speaker works. So I've made a 3D model to illustrate. This one is playing the most simple or most pure sound possible, a sine wave. The movement of the speaker in and out can be plotted onto a graph where x, or the horizontal axis, is time, and y, or the vertical axis, is amplitude, or perceived loudness. The frequency of a sound is measured in hertz, which is literally cycles per second. So the pitch of the sound corresponds to the length of each cycle. The shorter the cycle, the higher the sound, and vice versa. So the amplitude or perceived loudness of the sound corresponds directly to how far the speaker moves in and out. This can be translated to musical instruments. The drum is an easy example to illustrate this concept. As the drums hit, the diaphragm moves just like a speaker cone. But like a speaker, the drum or any other musical instrument needs an enclosure for the sound to bounce around and build upon itself to reach our ears at a decent volume. The lower the sound, the larger the chamber must be. This is called resonance, and the cavity is called a resonance chamber. So the same goes for animals, but I'll get back to this later. As I said earlier, the sine wave is the most pure sound possible. Most sounds in real life are much more complex, with more detailed waveforms to match. For example, when a single string of a guitar is plucked, the lowest frequency of the sound, which is called the fundamental, is the same as the cycle of vibration of the string. As it's amplified by the resonance chamber, complexity is added to the sound, which we call harmonics. The main factors influencing the harmonics are the material the instrument is made out of and its shape. But I'm getting off track. So humans can hear on average from 20 to 20,000 hertz or cycles per second. I'm sure you've been at a concert or in some douchebag's car and experienced sound at a high enough level that it shakes your insights. Only loud sub bass can do this, mainly frequencies below about 100 hertz. And amazingly, we have plenty of anecdotal evidence that Bigfoot can produce the sort of levels of sub bass needed to rattle your insights. Check out these three examples from Sasquatch Chronicles. This one was losing its mind. It was snapping trees. It was shaking trees, and it gave a roar that 
just made my knees go to jello. I felt like I was about to fall down. And all of a sudden, like something out of a movie, he turns his torso toward us, and he's looking right at us. He, this is the part I'll never forget, ever. He curls his freaking lip up, and he's got his lip kind of curled up over his teeth, and he opens his mouth a little bit, and he makes this sound like... So freaking loud, man. It shook, it shook, the car shook us. I thought my heart was going to bust out of my chest when they'd done that. They said the screaming that started. Daughter come home in absolute tears, and he came home visibly shaken. And he said, I have never heard anything like this. I have never heard anything like this. The screaming, the roaring, the bellering, he said it blew right through you when this thing screamed. Listen to enough Sasquatch encounter reports, and you'll soon find that that is the standard angry Sasquatch roar. So it seems Sasquatch can produce sub bass. But can they produce sounds even lower than the human ear can distinguish? There's a whole world of sound that's below our range of hearing that can also be damaging. Infrasound typically describes sound below 20 hertz. Usually, it's too low for humans to pick up. Yet some animals communicate in this range. Like elephants vocalize in a low rumble that we can't hear. Tigers use a great variety of vocalizations for communication and their mighty roar is only one of them. When it comes to communicating or warning other animals, tigers would rather start snorting or hissing than roaring. Producing and imitating various vocalizations falls in the tiger's field of expertise. These big cats are known to simulate the voices of other animals in order to attract prey. Roaring, as a form of tiger communication, is a very poorly studied phenomenon. The roar of a tiger contains low-frequency sounds that can be heard up to a mile away. But these low-frequency sounds aren't only used to transmit information to other tigers, but are also known to have an intimidating and paralyzing effect on animals and humans. There is research stating that the mighty roar contains sounds below 20 hertz and is capable of taking the breath away of even experienced human trainers. This low-pitched sound, called infrasound, can travel long distances permeating buildings, cutting through dense forests, and even passing through mountains. But infrasound can be artificial too. Loudspeakers and public address systems, industrial machinery, that kind of thing, can kick out sounds that are too low in frequency for humans to hear, but it might be making us sick. But there is evidence that infrasounds cause more than just headaches. Some researchers think it might be responsible for that creepy haunted house feeling. One paper published in the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research suggests that a standing sound wave of specifically 18.9 Hz is responsible for some of the spooky happenings in their lab. Researchers at Coventry University kept seeing moving things out of the corners of their eyes. Their hair kept standing on end. They felt simply dreadful any time they were in the lab. But one day, they noticed a piece of equipment was vibrating without an apparent cause and discovered that an extractor fan was creating a standing wave at, you guess it, 18.9 hertz. When they turned off the fan, one of the authors described the feeling as if a huge weight was lifted. And researchers have tested this idea on a larger audience, literally. British scientists played music to a large auditorium filled with people and slipped infrasound into some of their songs. Some people in the audience said they felt uneasy or sorrowful, getting chills down the spine or nervous feelings of revulsion or fear when the songs contain infrasound. Spooky, right? So we've got a creature much larger than a tiger known to produce sounds much louder than the tiger's roar. As you'd expect with that giant barrel-shaped chest as a resonance chamber. And amazingly, just like the tiger, Sasquatch are well known for mimicking their prey. Even the voices of people, which is quite frightening when you think about it. And then there's the mountains of reports of people feeling infrasound-like effects while in the presence of Sasquatch. Here's just a couple. 
uh, I'd say that in diameter, those trees were probably eight inches across. And then had his arms spread wide and was holding on to him and kind of braced himself between them, rocking back and forth. But I kind of got the impression that he was showing me his teeth. And he kind of made a weird face, you know. And I thought, oh, boy, it's time to go. That's when I was getting hit and the rumbling in my chest and the, the fear and dread and terror that I was about to get clobbered. I don't know if it was just fear um, or that I got such an adrenaline dump that it just made me go weak. I don't know what that was, but it was truly terrifying, and I was so scared. Um, and all I could think to do was, I have to get out of here. I have to back up very, very slowly and deliberately and for goodness sakes, lock my knees, because if I go down, I'm never getting up. Like, I really felt all the blood drain out of me, and, you know, I was shaky, real shaky at that point. And I got, I think, maybe about six or 800 feet away from the path that I had entered, and I was basically on my hands and my knees throwing up. And again, I don't know if that's adrenaline. I don't know if the roaring that had happened had infrasound in, I have no clue. Or is it just sheer terror and fear? I'm guessing it's a bit of both. Hopefully by now you realise that there's nothing magical about infrasound and that in theory it could well be within the capabilities of an animal like Bigfoot. And within the eyewitness reports on just Sasquatch Chronicles alone, there's countless anecdotal reports of these creatures producing sub bass at levels which can be felt as well as heard. It seems highly likely to me that a large adult Sasquatch could produce frequencies lower than the human ear can detect. And then there's all the reports of seemingly paranormal events associated with Sasquatch encounters which can easily be explained by the well-documented effects of infrasound. I'll leave you with this encounter by Scott Carpenter which features a probable infrasound zapping as well as some truly anomalous but not unique behaviour which I'll be featuring in the next part. Thanks for watching. One of the things that really took me over the top was that episode I was with Greg Geratic. We had done a day in the Great Smoky Mountains. We were walking back out the trail, and, and I intended to try this experiment, and, and if this was a good time to do it, I was with someone. They kind of demonstrated, because these things understand me, these things know what was going on. So we're walking on our way out. He's got a, he's got a digital voice recorder he's recording on. I'm recording with my back trail camera. I said, on the way out, I'm going to start putting them down. I'm going to call them out. I'm going to make fun of them. So that's what I started doing. You know, we're about maybe a quarter mile away from the parking lot, you know, saying stuff like, these big foot, they're a bunch of pansy, you know. You know, they're afraid of us. That's why they won't show themselves. They ain't got the gut. They're just full of crap. Being pretty verbally abusive. And so as we're walking, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I'm in the middle of one of my ramps. I get hit with something. And all I can describe it is, it's, it was like, uh, as a boy, every now and then you'd be stupid enough to grab a electric fence. And it hit me in the left, or in the right side, excuse me, it ran up my right arm, across my chest, and then out my left arm. I mean, it was like a thud. I mean, it hit me hard. I, I stumbled. I almost went down. And it, it addled me. It just, you know, it, it really got, it hit me hard. I mean, this was painful. And I stumbled and, 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 and Craig kind of reached over and grabbed me. All right. I said, yeah, I said, did you, did you feel that? And he said, no, but he said, I heard a whoosh go by my face about the same time you stumbled. And, uh, and, and we kind of, we looked around. I, once I got my composure, you know, we filmed, we looked, we couldn't find anything, couldn't make anything else happen. So we go on home. On my video, there's a little bit of a pop. It's like a, you know, you can hear like some sort of noise, but you really can't make it out. But his DVR really got an interesting recording. At the time I got hit, you can hear this pop, and then it's, there's a crackle after it. So it's a, you know, a pop and then, you know, crackle. And the re interesting thing was, is, you know, when I got up in the morning and you got to go to the bathroom, well, I went to urinate, there was quite a bit of blood in my urine. I mean, it was a, a scary amount of blood. 
So I called him up and I said, I, I hate to ask this, but I got to. I said, when you got up this morning, did you have urine in your blood? And he says, yeah, I was going to ask you. If you had urine in your blood? I said, yeah, I had urine in my blood. So Bigfoot researchers will call that fapping. And there's no doubt this was in direct response to what I was doing. You know, there's no doubt in my mind. So, you, you know, the gig is up, guys. You understood me in English. You got angry, and you responded appropriately. 